Welcome, everyone. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit about the value of personal informatics into the patient or e-patient healthcare practitioner relationship. Um, you know, it's clear today that we are absolutely in the midst of a personal informatics revolution. Uh, you know, it's easier than ever for anyone to go into your local Radio Shack and buy something that looks like this, or something that looks like this, or something that looks like this, or something that looks like one of these, uh, all beautiful and lovely and engaging devices that each, and to be able to capture data that only a few years ago we thought were, wasn't going to be able to be possible. Um, and so, you know, whether it's a Shine, or a Jawbone Up, or a Body Media Fit, uh, or, whether or whether you're downloading an app, uh, that is helping you keep track of your step count or an app that is keeping you track of the places that you go on a daily basis or whether you self-report on a website, um, it's easier than ever to be able to capture continuous streams of data at low cost with surprising quality and not requiring, most importantly, not requiring any intervention on the part of a user or a healthcare practitioner. Uh, and this is a really a growth industry. Uh, conservative estimates that I found online this week uh, put it at a $12 billion market size. Uh, we expect there to be 100 million of these kinds of devices that are to be sold annually by the year 2016. Uh, and this business is attracting, or this industry is attracting serious investment. Uh, Fitbit just raised $43 million this year. Uh, Body Media was purchased by Jawbone uh, for more than 100 million, if you believe the published reports. Uh, and if you, if you look at Kickstarter, uh, there's more than 10 million of committed funds for different kinds of wearable devices or health tracking applications. Uh, and so this is only really gonna grow as we start capturing more and additional types of data. Uh, so what we're seeing now is really just the first step in terms of wearables and, and, and uh, applications, smartphone applications or, or tablet applications that are able to capture these kinds of indicators. You know, we're all familiar with devices that are able to capture things like our heart rate or the amount of steps that we take on a day or our temperature. I recently saw uh, headphones that Intel was showing that were able to capture your heart rate and your ambient body temperature uh, through earbuds. Uh, so we're also seeing things like metabolic rate or sleep or respiration or mood or stress, all from a, a wearable device that you can keep in your pocket, put on your wrist, or something that's already running on your smartphone. This is just the first step, though. We're also seeing a generation of new generation of applications that are able to capture behavioral data. Uh, so on my company, ARO, builds an application called Saga that is able to capture not only where you've been, but what you've been doing on a regular basis. So we're able to capture accurate location histories. We're also able to capture activity. Uh, so right now, Saga running on my smartphone knows that I'm not only in a conference center uh, and that I'm 600 miles away from home, but also knows that I'm in a, a quiet room where the only, only voice can be heard is mine. Uh, so either I'm pontificating or I'm talking to myself again. Uh, the idea is these apps can also recognize contextual cues. So we're getting to a world where your smartphone can recognize that you're on a first date. Your smartphone can recognize that you're a passenger in a car moving 70 miles an hour down the 280 and not the driver. It uh, can allow you to text, and also, but not allow the driver to text. Uh, it can also recognize what kind of exercise you're doing, whether you're doing push-ups or whether you're running or whether you're swimming. Uh, and this all is important because this kind of behavioral data is important because it gives a level of context, a level of meaning uh, that we can't just get from a continuous stream of heart rate data alone. And that meaning is important. We've talked a lot about in this conference about the kinds of stories that and the, the, the quality of the value of quality reporting uh, that can that go between a patient and his or her healthcare practitioner. Uh, and these, you know, not you know, recording, capturing these indicators is one the first step. The idea is going towards the, uh, being able to tell stories or be able to contextualize or provide meaning for those streams of indicators is really going to go a long way to be able to providing real value that healthcare practitioners can use. Um, so, you know, it's not surprising here that this panel joins me in believing that personal informatics represents a real valuable new source of diagnostic data for healthcare practitioners and clinicians. And, you know, the opportunities are really clear. You know, we're, with these devices, we're offering unparalleled access to data that, you know, like I said a second ago, we didn't have two years ago. And we're, you know, the most important thing from a diagnostic perspective is that we're relying less and less on self-reporting and we're able to automate some of that process. Uh, and, you know, if you look at something like what the kind of user experience that you can support on a smartphone, we're able to, you know, a health, it's conceivable that a healthcare practitioner can probe the user in real time, uh, you know, track the efficacy of a treatment, a course of treatment, or even ask the user questions or present them with, uh, you know, outcomes of their current patterns of behavior. 
And what really gets exciting about this is this, all these continuous streams of data allow us to really see big data effects in what essentially amounts to little data, your own personal data. Uh, so we're able to capture sparse events, things that may occur rather infrequently. Or, uh, and we're able to see a richer feature space that we're able to model over and to be able to extract meaning from. Uh, so, you know, we're, you know, big data has really gained a lot of currency in the last few years. Uh, and so really what we're seeing with the rise and the adoption of these uh, devices and applications is the rise of little data. Um, so the question that we're going to focus on here in the rest of the panel is, are we ready? You know, are we ready to be able to adopt little data into our healthcare practice? Uh, and so there's some, you know, it's, it's, there's some significant and maybe obvious challenges to adoption. First of all, we as technologists, we as device manufacturers, we as software manufacturers need to provide data and the data quality that healthcare practitioners need. Right? It's not good enough for us to be able to provide you know, approximate data if you really need you know, high quality, highly accurate data to be able to, to base a diagnosis on. Uh, and it's also not valuable if we're providing data that you also have in spades. Um, we also need the tools and infrastructure to help uh, healthcare practitioners deal with this data. We cannot, as, as, as pur purveyors of this data, uh, drown healthcare practitioners in, in a tsunami of incoming data and, and call it valuable. You know, we really need to provide that insight and tell stories. Um, and finally, as we've brought, you know, mentioned a couple times in this conference previously, we need to be able to sync these streams of data with existing records that are out there uh, and do it in a way that doesn't create more work for an already strained force. Um, so we've got our work cut out for us. If we're really going to capitalize on the promise of little data, we need to be able to not only capture this data, we need to operationalize it and interpret it and provide it to healthcare practitioners in a way that makes sense. Um, but you know, the idea is if we could bring about this little data revolution, we really think that there is an a, a important impact or a salubrious impact on the, you know, the healthcare consumer and the healthcare professional's relationship. You know, we can actually provide more effective self-care or diagnostics uh, to, the, uh, to the practitioner. We can provide stronger uh, patient-practitioner relationships because the, the practitioner knows that the patient is reporting accurately or reporting what authentically or accurately did occur in his or her life. Uh, and we can provide a real uh, meaningful alternative to patient self-reporting. Okay, so before I introduce my, my disti uh, distinguished and esteemed colleagues, um, I want to call out that we want to hear from you. Uh, so we would like to hear you know, two different things, and you can talk to us on the social media channels, or you can come, feel free to come to the mic and we'll, we'll call on you as, as the conversation permits. But we want to hear about your own experiences with wearable devices or personal health tracking devices. We want to know, you know what got you interested in the, you know, what drew you to your first Fitbit or for your first body media uh, fit or your first shine. You know, and why did you use it? You know, what, were the, what were the imperatives that you, what were the things that you tried to capture? Why was it imperative that you wear this or carry this around? Uh, and then were your, we want to know whether you were or were not successful in your experience with one of these apps or with one of these trackers. Uh, this helps us figure out exactly how to engage uh, with the customers and the patients that we're trying to reach. All right. So with that said, I'm going to turn it to each of these four individuals and have them introduce themselves, tell them a little bit about who they are, what they're working on, and uh, why it's important for them to talk to you today. So I'll start with Ted. Thanks, Andy. My name is uh, Ted Tanner. I'm the co-founder and CTO of PocketDoc Incorporated. We are enabling the business of health through price transparent marketplace. And what that essentially means is price transparency, is, as far as I'm concerned, is an overloaded term. And we're further up in the food chain compared to a device, although we definitely bring in these devices as signals. And what we're actually doing is giving a self-pay marketplace to the consumer. And we're allowing the consumer to, in fact, request for quote to a plethora of practitioners based on specialty and condition. And so that, that upends the process, that enables the consumer empowered in their search for uh, care and time and date for services. In addition to that, we enable the ability, when they request for quote, we bring up their, if in fact they do have insurance, because we, we, and some of us do have insurance in this case, we bring up the deductible, their HSA amount, how much the out-of-pocket cost is for that procedure, and then compare it to the day and date self-pay for the user with rated uh, practitioners. 
In addition, we're actually moving toward a model where the practitioner will rate the consumer. So um, many people, we're actually up further up the food chain. Um, my background is in semantics, machine learning, uh, security, and uh, numerical analysis. That's great. That's awesome. Evo? Hi, I'm Evo. Um, one of the co-founders of Body Media about 14, 15 years ago uh, came out of a wearable computer lab out of Carnegie Mellon. Uh, with the idea of turning the sensors from the environment towards the body and uh, with a mission that we started with a mission that was like making uh, personal dashboards for the human body. Um, we just saw a huge gap in the space. Um, healthcare was going to change at some point, but also, um, you know, unless you were an athlete or you got sick and went to the hospital, really was no understanding of what's happening with you every day. And uh, we had them on coffee makers in your cars, these dashboards, but there was nothing for us, for the rest of us. And so we went off on a mission to go make hardware, because it didn't exist out there, uh, analytics engines and software, so that, and in ways that was way better to look at stuff than an Excel spreadsheet, which usually was your common, common dashboard at that time for a lot of people, uh, if they had any information about themselves. And still is today in many cases when you look at some of the quantified self, uh, uh, selfers out there, they're still using tools that are pretty antiquated. Uh, for real visualization and really understanding what's happening with the data. So um, over 14 years, like it, it, started, it started as dashboards, but over time, very quickly, with the, uh, the idea was to be helping people change behavior, watch, you know, do things like lose weight, manage conditions. And uh, more recently, as of a um, couple months ago, we closed with Jawbone, and now we're, um, we've, uh, we've, we've merged uh, the two companies together on a mission around health and lifestyle. Uh, that is a, a shared quest. We started companies back a long time ago at the same time, and uh, we see a lot of synergies going forward to try to, try to bring a, a lot more of this, uh, of the idea that we have internally, which is living better, which definitely includes health, but also makes life more enjoyable in other ways. Could be media consumption, could be easier interactions with your cell phone, um, easier interactions with your home, these kind of things. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Cool. Sunny? Well, I'll keep it short since uh, you heard me uh, yap on stage yesterday. Um, founder of uh, Misfit Wearables. Uh, we're actually pretty young. Uh, we were actually inspired by um, guys like Evo and the, work, the amazing work they've done at, over the last actually decade and a half in wearable computing and learning from companies like that. Um, you know, we came from the blood glucose monitoring space. We did that for about 10 years, so we're medical device folks too. Uh, it's not wearable at the time. And really the thing that we learned, why we got into this space in the first place was um, it was the one area where we felt we could help make technology more invisible actually, um, blend more into our lives rather than at the front and center of our lives. You know, having one of those areas of technology and products where we saw the promise that you could really have things that would serve you rather than us serve machines, uh, which uh, a lot of times it feels like, you know, that, that that's what's happening. So um, our mission is uh, to uh, work, is to develop great wearable products, products that uh, uh, you'd wear all the time for a long time by a lot of people, um, helping make wearable products really wearable. So that's, that's one of the first, and one of the first areas of application is in the wearable sensing space. We're really excited about that. Uh, we love the work that some of these other companies are doing. Um, and the Shine, our first product, is our small contribution to the ecosystem. Uh, we had a lot of fun making it and uh, hope, hope to be bringing out other wearable products uh, soon. Hi, everybody. I'm John Kino. I'm the co-founder of a startup called Spree. Uh, the five letters of Spree stand for strength, protection, recovery, energy, and enjoyment, which we believe are the five functions of food. So we're looking at different ways to help people understand their relationship with food and help them to begin a journey of reimagining the way that they buy their food. So I have kind of an interesting story of how I got here. Uh, I was uh, about 10 years ago in a room with a very wise woman uh, who made a declaration that was kind of seared on my brain. She said that the world would become personal, portable, and digital. 
And at that time, the way we thought about personal, portable, and digital really was in the framework of music and photos and pictures. And maybe a little bit with news, but the, the notion of what personal was was a little undefined, and it was in your hands to kind of define what personal meant. A few years later, uh, the iPhone came out, and geolocation was something that I thought was just a, a fascinating opportunity that recontextualized what personal actually meant. It could be relevant, it could be contextual to where I was and what I was actually doing. So uh, my journey kind of continued, and I uh, uh, got a, a real interesting job at American Express. And uh, my job for American Express and Corporate Development was to help the company define its digital future. It was a very broad uh, scope of work, and I was working with some very smart people. But we started to study the relationship between buyers and sellers, and looking at a world in which uh, quantity was starting to be less important than quality. And American Express has a long tradition of looking at card members as people, as, as things more than just a, a vehicle of spending. So I got introduced to a few entrepreneurs who were working in the space of digital health and uh, found what they were doing was really resonant uh, in my life. And I thought as far as the, the vision that Carly Fiorina was the wise woman who said personal, portable, and digital when she was running HP, uh, I thought that uh, all the things that we had seen in science fiction and the stories that we had told were starting to, you know, form right here around me. So when I got to Seattle uh, about two years ago, uh, I met a naturopathic doctor who's been playing around with technology for about 20 years and uh, learned about some things that he invented that he uses science-based, peer-reviewed science research and correlates health and illnesses to nutrition. And I got very excited because I thought this was the opportunity where we could take a habit that all of us have. Uh, we learn it from our family of origin, we learn it from our friends, which is the food that we eat. And the food that we eat, according to Joe Pizzorno, is related in many, many cases to our wellness or our illness state. So we've been working, we're taking baby steps right now, learning about how users interact with advice that we can give on the platform that helps them filter through the information that comes from nutritional facts and labels. Uh, I found some information that Nielsen uh, fielded just last year around the world. And uh, everywhere on the planet, the two most important uh, contributors to a purchase decision are price, number one, and number two is health. But the definition of health and what is personal health and what is personal wellness is colored by so many things. And when you go in a grocery store um, a generation ago, uh, there were about 15,000 different products on the shelf. A generation before that, there were only 5,000 products on the shelf. And today, an average grocery store has 45,000 different products there. So we've been working on ways to help guide people through these choices uh, that are personally relevant to them, that achieve the functions uh, that, they, that they wish for, and that help them sort of see their own patterns, see their traditions and their habits, and look at them just a little bit differently. Thanks, John. I, I will wrap up, because I'm also a panelist as well as your intrepid moderator. Uh, I'm, like I said before, I'm Andy Hickel, and I am the CEO and co-founder of a startup, Seattle-based startup called ARO. And we make life logging software uh, that runs on your smartphone and turns your smartphone into the best way to capture where you've been, what you've done, uh, and maybe we provide a little bit of insight to help you understand why it all mattered. Uh, and we use sensors. Our mission is to be able to do that capture uh, from the sensors that are already on your smartphone uh, and to do that with little or no intervention from you. Well, the idea is we want to be able to build a resource that tells you the story of your authentic self, not your idealized self, not the, the you that you wish to be or the you that you know, works out three times a week, but the you that's you know, just okay, right? The you that pro you know, probably works too hard and spends too much time in the car and eats fast food more often than you'd like. Uh, and the idea is that by coming to grips with that who you are, uh, we create a digital record uh, that you can use to either to you know, craft your own plans, to share with your friends, 
uh, and maybe to even provide some sort of a legacy to you know to something to leave behind. Uh, and so we've had you know we've had an unbelievable run over the last six or seven months uh, with an app in the marketplace called Saga and. Uh, you know, we're really touched by the reaction that people have had to it because it's one of those kind of applications that people come to it and they see, make their own meaning and find other kinds of ways to be able to have it be, uh, find their own value from it. Uh, and so we're really excited about this panel and, and, and talking with these gentlemen up here because we believe that if I could hand my life log that as generated by Saga uh, to my healthcare practitioner, uh, he or she would be able to kind of take insight from it uh, or validate that I was actually doing what I was supposed to be doing or exactly uh, how, how off the straight and narrow I ultimately was. Uh, so let me take a step back. We're going to have a discussion here around four different threads. We're going to talk about what kind of data we can capture from wearables and smartphones right now. Uh, some of you are you know, very familiar with the step counts and the heart rate. Uh, you'll be unbelievably amazed by the kinds of other things that are, these guys are working on. Um, then we'll shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit about why we're capturing this data. Uh, what motivates people to do this? Uh, what, you know, what, what, what keeps people from, what are the barriers that keep people from uh, really kind of sticking with a, a wearable for more time? And then we'll talk a little bit about market adoption and uh, where we're seeing growth and where we're not seeing growth. Uh, and then we'll finally wrap up by talking a little bit about the future and the insight that we can provide from this data. So we've got hardware experts, uh, we've got software experts, and we have data analytics experts. Uh, and so we'll, we'll start the conversation here, but feel free to chime in and, and talk to us about your experiences uh, and ask us questions. These are the guys who make this all happen. Um, so Eva, why don't we start with you? And Sunny, why don't we talk about the kind of data that we can capture uh, you know, from these wearables? These, these, most of these are look very kind of unassuming devices, uh, but they capture a sophisticated amount of data. Oh, sir. I'll, I'll let you start since you're the one who's uh, kind of started much of this. <laughs> uh, so the sensor, a lot of times, well, body media in particular, um, we always had a multi-sensor approach uh, to collecting data um, on the body was because um, we just had this bias that if you're just looking at the world through heart rate or motion or step count, it's like looking at the world through one eye. And, um, and you don't really get a chance to really be able to tell a lot about the individual. It kind of gets um, the, the monocular view of the world uh, start, you know, for trying to make algorithms run with a single kind of source of information gets pretty tough. So um, a lot of things that we, so we started with uh, things like looking at heat coming off the body temperature, conductivity of skin, motion, have evolved into looking at ECG and other types of, um, you know, heart, heart related waves. And, um, we fuse that information together to make it interesting for people. That's something maybe they can more understand, like calories burned, physical activity minutes a day, whether it's moderate or vigorous, uh, steps that they did take, um, whether or not they were lying down in bed versus sleeping, how long that was, how, what the difference of that was, what their sleep efficiency was for every night. So you can look at it longitudinally, but they can look at it right there in a the moment. And do it in a way that you didn't have an on button or anything else, you just slide it on, it should work, and you should be able to download the data. And we ended up applying that kind of lifestyle data portfolio of, of data bits into, uh, into different applications. One of the biggest um, opportunities we had early was in weight management. Uh, so um, a lot of people out there, there's a lot of the different ways to do weight management. Not everyone's in calorie counting, but there were a lot of people out there tried a lot of different things. They were looking for some way to automate what's really happening in the world, like the dashboards I said earlier. And so we ended up having this opportunity in, in uh, clubs and weight management clinics and in corporate wellness environments where we were able to uh, provide a solution at, uh, where we got letters back from people all the time saying, I've been looking for ways to manage my lifestyle in all these different ways. I never really could until I found this product. And that kept, uh, kept the, the wheels churning. And then we started getting into other um, conditions that we've been looking at unfolding into and go from there. So I think um, in terms of simply, uh, you know, as a starting point, the on-body stuff was where we focused, and it was also getting to the last inch, because if I'm in the cell phone or I'm in the room, it's not exactly coming with me, and it's a, probably a cheaper infrastructure play. Um, so we just decided, put it wearable, let it go around with you and your world. Right. Hopefully you can pick up data from other sources along the way, and I'm sure we're going to talk about more data right. sources as we go further. So Sunny, what's next? I mean, so we're, I mean, my shine is, is fabulous. It's, it's counting my activity level over, over the day. Um, what's, what kinds of things should we, be, as consumers, be expecting to kind of take advantage of in the future? And I'm not looking for any kind of proprietary secrets, but what kinds of things can we communicate as a community or that can expect as a community to be out there on the frontier in 18 months or so? Mm -hmm. Well, I, um, <clears throat> uh, 
Measuring new things is, I don't know if we're going to be measuring new things as much as how we measure them and how these will become products. Because, <coughs> um, by example, the stuff that, you know, Evo's been working on, the, you know, the sensors have been around for a long time. Yeah. You know, right. three-axis accelerometers, um, heart rate monitoring sensors and whatnot. They've been around for probably decades, right? Um, and so these sensors aren't new. It's just the fact that uh, electronics can be, have been miniaturized so that you can wear them. And now we have the smartphone, and now you can connect them. And uh, because of mobile internet, we're seeing the proliferation of many of these products. I think that's enabling, really amplifying the hardware experience in, in incredible ways. So um, <clears throat> I'm not really sure if we're going to see. We probably will see new uh, kinds of sensors and whatnot, but um, new ways of interacting with that data, new ways of collecting that data more seamlessly. Mm -hmm. I think that we'll probably see more of those for sure. Uh, so without trying to guess what's uh, down the pipeline, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, the, I, I think uh, it's going to be more about uh, the, the, the embodiments and also the interpretation of this data. I think uh, we'll be with more computational power, with um, m greater abilities to transfer data so that it can, it can get to devices with more computational power rather than having to do everything uh, in situ. Uh, we'll be able to, like, I think, derive much more interesting information. You know, especially when it's um, an amalgamation of multiple sensor um, things, whether it's stuff that uh, you guys are making, or with uh, data coming from uh, f from the devices itself. I mean, now that you know we've got the things like the M7 coprocessor in the iPhone, mm -hmm. uh, iPhone 5s at least. Um, you know, it's even easier to make fitness tracking right. apps. And uh, and so, are we going to see? I I think we're going to see a lot more. Um, the use of data from multiple sources to really get more insight, and uh, finally, I mean that's 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 pretty exciting. Is that can also change the the way we expect to interact with these devices in terms of their form factor? I mean, we we have we have armbands, we have wristbands, we have uh, things that are beautiful and clip on. We have smartphones. Uh, are we going to see a, a, a greater proliferation of different kinds of form factors that we're going to be interacting with, or are we going to see some sort of consolidation around smart watches or? Things that look more like smartphones. I mean, are smartphones going to be the the ultimate wearable of the of the foreseeable future, or are there still going to be a niche for these kind of other kinds of wearables that are out there? Yeah, I, I, you know, I don't think smartphones are very wearable, mm. although they are worn a lot. Exactly. Uh, you know, and when I don't have my smartphone, I feel naked. So, yeah, it's arguable that it, uh, that smartphones are a wearable product. Um, I think there are a lot of efforts in doing like more fully wearable things, shirts and pants and underwear and the you know belts. We've got socks now that yeah. are you know that have. And the question is, how good will some of the will the execution of these products be? Will they be good enough so that uh, millions and millions of people will use them? Right. I don't know. You know. Um, well, that's a good thread to pick up yeah. here. Let's ask the audience: How many of you own, not uh, strictly own, a wearable device? Or Okay, keep your hands up, Maybe everybody. Right. How many of you Maybe have your right. wearable device with you right now? There you go. Yeah. So Maybe, Maybe two thirds. <laughs> this is not a typical audience. Um, it's definitely not typical. No. It's, it, but but it has changed over the years for sure. <laughs> well, what you're talking about is are. not too many people actually know about them for one thing. So and I that's guess where a big that's where a big demographic is. Yeah, this is a very not. I mean, usually you know, crowd, even a techie crowd, ten percent, five percent. Oh yeah. So, so yeah, what are the I'd barriers? Say, I'd, say, I'd say I'd say a little piece on it. Like when we first um, when we first started up going in, it was more B two B relationships, like with health clubs and stuff like that. And so that we had this kind of captured audience, which was different. But then they would actually bring the consumer in. There would be a big coaching environment there, and and high touch sale, that kind of stuff. And it was years before we thought, about 2008, all of a sudden we said, well, maybe the world's ready for self-care. And so we started putting some feelers out to Amazons and some stuff like that. And it really surprised me that we even, all of a sudden a little division showed up out of Amazon. And it, uh, how people even found us out of 60,000 SKUs, I have no idea. But there was a latent need out there for sure. And then when you looked at the heat map on the United States, you started seeing people, they did show up in Kansas and Arkansas, but also Alaska and California, New York and Florida. And you go like, wow, there's actually something here. But you know, definitely um, the awareness of this 
is not as pervasive as the quote unquote was used earlier, the echo chamber might suggest. A lot of people, like I've sat in a lot of meetings with like thousands of diabetics talking about their, talking about their journeys and so forth, and they describe a product that could help them with their lifestyle, and they have no idea that there's like 10 different versions that might exist for their flavor or what they'd like to do. And uh, so I think it's, I, I really do think that there's a, still an awareness issue out there what, that these are even possible. And even the value, everyone would love to will this cell phone to work, but in the end, I, th I really think being the last inch, you really don't get the fidelity that you want in the end that the consumers expect until you get there. So what, what is the barrier that we have to overcome? I mean, uh, you know, uh, if you listen to the analysts, they talk about this as a billion, you know, several billion dollar industry. They said this is going to be, we're going to sell 100 million, do 100 million units a year. What, 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 what's the road look like from where we are now to, to that point? I'm sure this is something that keeps you guys up at night. Well, I, I talk about it in terms of the, it's not so much the what, what are you collecting, but what are you going to do with it? So the, the idea that right now we have these devices which are actually relatively expensive, uh, they're uh, bought by elites who, who can afford these things, but the, the word of how they impact people's lives, the personal stories, uh, how people are using these uh, and sharing them with their friends, uh, it's not just that I post it on Facebook and people ask me what, what is a shine, but that I talk about it and I show people, I demonstrate it, I witness the experience. So as we put more meaning behind what this input comes to us, uh, I would say that we're entering this age of enlightenment. And it's a different type of enlightenment uh, than we've seen before. Not just a utility, knowing that my temperature or how many steps I took today, is, it's, it's, it's interesting, of course. But what does that mean to me, and how does that change my future? And sometimes we don't know that until sometime in the, a long time in the future, and I can look back and see what, what was going on that day. So I think that as we look forward to the future, it's all the other people who are going to start using the devices that we're building or the solutions that we're trying to build in apps and how they're going to start using it and sharing it between each other. That's going to be really exciting. And you just opened your API this. You, you made an announcement this week about your API, didn't you? Uh, no, uh, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Soon. Okay. Okay. Soon. Okay. We announced that we'll announce yes, it. We're going to have news here. <laughs> <laughs> I think it might have been you guys, right? Yeah, we, we also did, yeah. 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 And we've uh, got several generations of APIs now that we've been releasing out there. More and more open <laughs> every time, so it should start to show some new applications that we can't even have, we don't even right. have time to focus on. So the problem is we're looking for a, a couple killer use cases or is it to, to be able to take this mainstream. I mean, are we looking for, do we need additional data? I, I, I guess I'm, I'm well, I, I feel the pain because I'm in the exact same space, but I don't know, you know, I, I don't, I, I really am having trouble seeing through the fog. So, so um, when we stood up uh, our marketplace, we were looking at two sides of an equation. And our demographic and our product experimentation was the practitioner and the doctor, how to get online, how to get a social presence, right? And the other one was the hub and spoke environment of the caregiver, which happened to be a demographic female, 25 to 35. And so you're looking at two people whose lives are inundated with different types of alerts, some organic, some inorganic. And what I'm fond of saying is a signal is not human, right? We can we can amass these you know, one-dimensional, two-dimensional signals, but does that, that doesn't give you a picture of the human itself, nor the people that are relying on you. Right. So one of the, um, one of the impediments and, and the, on, the, on the back end, that's why we're trying to work on an on-ramp. I call it an on-ramp as fast as possible to get a presence, get a dashboard for that practitioner to say, here's my constituency, and what does the situational awareness look for Edna Smith, right? Um, that being said, they have to be very simple interfaces. Um, you know, I, I worked at Apple and, and, and we focused on that, obviously. And, and the other side of the equation is, in most cases, and, and I have three children and a better half, uh, that great iPhone, the new gold iPhone that nobody has, is nowhere to be found right now. <laughs> right? So, um, or the wearable is torn up. So one of the things that I actually was in a discussion about is, well, why not make the house the sensor? Right? Now, you know, get, get, get with the Home Depots, the Lowe's, make the materials that sense the environment. 
But I think the, um, the two attention spans that we are fighting for that we need to maximize is the practitioner and the sp hub and spoke caregiver. So, so John, I mean, you're, how are you capturing your data that you, I mean, so you tell a very you know, organic, very, no pun intended, but a, a very human story uh, in terms of these choices that right. people make and that everybody makes. Uh, how are you capturing, how are you seeing your interaction with this data going forward? So the, the, uh, we're at a very early stage in developing our solution, and we've been working with about 90 uh, users in the Seattle area. And we conduct what's called a concierge test. So uh, they take pictures of their grocery store receipts, they email them to us, uh, we analyze it, and then we recommend three to five items that they should buy the following week that would help them toward their health goal. And uh, over the course of six or eight weeks, we can see buying behavior changing because we're giving people small, achievable goals to, um, to work toward. Uh, grocery stores like it because it changes purchase behavior, and it gets people to have a closer relationship with them as well. So the idea of collecting the ambient information, um, moving forward from the time when nutritional information was mm, kind of like a compass, and we needed to sort of figure out where we were going. The nutritional information, uh, based on uh, how familiar you are with macronutrition or micronutrients, uh, could help you find true north, but it's not necessarily going to help you get to where you're going. So what we'd really like to, to come up with is something that behaves like a GPS and helps people get their nutrition changing at their own pace and that it suits w what foods are familiar to them and understandable to them, maybe fit their cultural heritage or their friend group, their uh, relative uh, reference groups. So we want to work with grocery stores to take the information that uh, the mountain of information that every grocery store collects about its customers that right now is used upstream to supply chain management, to store marketing, to the layout of the stores, but it's not used to us, the people who created the information. So since we don't get a big view of what we've been buying, uh, when people uh, diary their, their, what they're eating, it's very helpful, but it's a, it's a very tedious process. And even with apps, it, it doesn't make it that much easier. But it sounds like awareness is, I mean, so being aware of the choices that you make, coming face-to-face -to -face with the data that you are collecting has its own benefits, right? I mean, that, that seems to be, you know, when I, when I first heard about uh, you know, an, an app like Moves, you know, it makes sense. I'll, sure, I'll download that and have that on my phone because that's another way, another way of keeping, making sure that I remain active. It holds me accountable. Uh, and you know, that seems to be, the, you know, the, at the core, whether it's your smart connected home as the sensor, you know, I'd want to have that or, or I have my, 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 re my supermarket receipt of self-aware or... Uh, yeah, or, or whatever doctor you pick and all this other stuff. Exactly. I, I, think, I think if you want to be participatory, you see really, I mean, there's people coming from all over, all different industries. Right into this space in order to provide people more awareness and tools of stuff that they've been basically in the dark about, right? And I think you say you asked a question earlier about the, um, the killer app. I mean, mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know. We, we see a lot of demand out there. We can't even fulfill it right now. So we think there's still a lot of learning and awareness that has to be built for sure. Uh, but I think the one thing that we keep looking at is that it's not, it's just like, you know, food's part of my life. Right. So is my activity, so is my sleep, so is the stress levels in my life, so is my com the comfort of my home or, the com or not being frustrated in a car. And, and so I think, you know, when we say this, when I said earlier, like living better and so forth, the killer app, as my perspective, has always been like having devices and ecosystems that work in unison with each other so that um, when I'm using it, I can use it for weight loss, but not, it's not just a weight loss tool, for mm -hmm. example. It might be something that makes the temperature in my house go down when I fall asleep, or it might, go, it might be something that uh, you know, helps me uh, get into my door easier when I have, a, when I have things all over my hands yeah. and so forth. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, or, or maybe I've gotten out of the weight management kick and now I'm doing marathons, or now some things have gotten a little complicated. I need to upgrade to a different level of, of surveillance of myself or of my grandmother or right. something. So, right. so I think there's a lot of things like this where it's more about, it's not like one app, it's the fact that there's an ecosystem of apps that make this thing, like a, like a phone can be customized, smartphones, uh, it can come into my life in the way I, I want to do it. And not everyone uses 300 apps on their phone. You know, they use like four, five, six, you know, stuff like that. Um, and I think uh, it's, it's, if you have the marketplace for it and there's mass there and scale there, which, you know, we're still waiting a little bit on, but it's starting to get better. 
that you, then those different consumers can kind of pick the journey that they want to have with these devices or experiences. And right. in the end, it is experiences, not necessarily the device is an enabler. Right. Or the, uh, the, the database with the dashboard is the enabler and it's concierging back to you. That's the enabler for me now to make choice and have uh, understanding of my lifestyle. And that's, I think that's where it starts to become a lot more powerful. But you know, these curves have taken some time to kind of start to undulate and kind of come exactly. together to a place where you can do more interesting things with it. So. Well, who do we see gravitating to these? You know, who are, who's, our, who's actively adopting these, these apps and wearables right now? I mean, who are, who's the beachhead here? Do we, do we understand who kind of, do we, do we have a, a good idea of who that target customer? I mean, one of the things I'm trying to, we'll trying to reframe this, move this discussion back towards the practitioner, mm -hmm. it is who do we expect ultimately to be the first e-patient to come in their office and say, hey, I've got my Shine and my Body Media and I've got this app called Spree, uh, I still don't feel good. Um, here's all this data, help me make sense of it, right? I mean, who, who's, the, who's the right, who's the first e-patient to come in the door? To it's, be it's not the 20-somethings, I'll just say that real quickly. I mean. We, we, our, market, our, market be, our market has skewed a little bit differently with our merger, but before, you know, before uh, walking into, with uh, Jawbone, I mean, we were the 40, uh, you know, 38 to 55 year old females. Um, yeah, that's us too. And uh, we're, they're making the decisions, they're, they're watching everybody else in the house at the same time sometimes. Um, but uh, we also had males involved uh, who were doing weight loss. You think like, no way, you know, the machoism and stuff like that. That's not true. Technology allows you to do it by yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes groups too, you know, makes the group more f yeah. proactive. So uh, we saw that really quickly that, um, and I don't think it skewed the whole lot different, um, but it's not the 20-somethings. I know when we started, every VC said it was going to be like three times a week in the 20-somethings right. well, for one hour a day. So it, it that's not true. That's it not dovetails true. closer to the, your traditional healthcare consumer. I think so. I think you can see that. I mean, uh, the consumer's getting older, like some people have said earlier today and yesterday. So you got to be a little careful to say it's, you know, what that pocket is. But there's definitely a sweet spot uh, in that 38 to 50, uh, 55 and, area. And there's something else, um, you know, sitting is the new smoking. Right. And, and, yeah, yeah. and we, um, and I think for years, uh, um, there, there's been some messages on certain small packages that have um, cancer sticks in them that, that said really bad stuff will happen to you if you do this, right? So changing behavior, um, you know, if you want that donut, most people are going to eat it to get that oxytocin bump. But I think a type of behavior is associated right now in the near term with these apps. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, that the practitioner, one of the, 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 the data that is given to the practitioner is great because they can sit down and go, well, if you don't start walking, you're going to have a heart attack. Right. And that's right now, that, that is truly where we are at from a, an enablement standpoint until we get this uh, fluid data really flowing from the consumer back to the practitioner in an organic process. Sonny, I, I I hate to call on you, but or it's directly, but you when the Shine is a is a beautiful brand, it is a beautiful piece of technology, uh, and it has you know it, you, one looks at it and says there's there's a target market in mind there. I mean, is your tar was your targeting for the Shine to be different than the kind of community, the kind of typical healthcare consumer that we've been talking about here, or been speculating about? Well, we're hoping that uh, we're still hoping that. Uh, Shine would be for everybody else. Um, and if um, techie, geeky types like it, that's great. If ath athletes like it, awesome. Uh, but we're hoping, as I always keep saying, Oklahoma City, that we can sell it in mm -hmm. Oklahoma City and not just, you know, Soma or, right, yeah, yeah. or uh, Palo Alto. Yeah. You know, um, we're hoping to <laughs> go a little bit more broader than that and making. Uh, things a bit more wearable, so that, yeah, so that the people and the photographs that we have on our site would actually exist. I can't help but think that this is a lot like the same kind of conversations that we had about smartphones uh, in the mid-2000s, right, 2003, 2004, 2005. Hey Andy, let me make a comment about Please. that. So um, all of the technologies that we're talking about, all of the personalization technologies, all the infrastructure existed. You know, we, the health industry is like the banking industry was 15 years ago. Right? And before that, it was ad placement. Um, so 
we'll, we'll probably talk about what I call the creepiness factor here is, is your, your creepiness dial. When we first launched Pocket Dock, we had this bleedingly beautiful, lickable user interface that came up, looked like Pinterest, had all this information, PubMed articles, community, so forth, and it was totally personalizing you in the moment, in the context, with contextual awareness. Mm -hmm. We were crawling all of your sock nets, we were doing everything you think happens in the background, and it does. And so somebody, uh, Edna Smith, would come on and log on, and she had been talking or tweeting or doing something in the background on one of the social networks about her uncle's heart pain. Well, we would recommend and we'd say, did y'all know that pig valves can be used for heart, heart replacement? That freaked them out. They said, you know, time out, time out. What is going on here? How did you know, even though this is great, I love it. How are you telling me so much about myself? Yeah, right. And we had to turn the creepiness dial down. We've had to do a lot of that over yeah, here. Right. People aren't, it, it takes, <laughs> there's a lot more we can be presenting to people yes, than we are. Yes, absolutely. That's, that's the point I was trying to make. It, the, 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 none of this is vaporware, but we have to season to taste the creepiness dial, right? I, I hate the fact there's a creepiness style. I mean, that's a, that's a right. it's, it's a comment that's often lodged, at, uh, you know, uh, in our direction with Saga as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about what Saga knows. I mean, Saga knows that I'm driving 80 miles an hour down the 280 after leaving a meeting at a venture capitalist, listening to the Beastie Boys at max volume in a rented car, and I'm heading towards SFO. Right. And All it's still, of, hopefully it, it, happy because you landed the deal. Well, that's the story, <laughs> and right? No, and, no <laughs> so, police, and no policeman sending you some ticket. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but the idea is all of that is possible given your smartphone right now. Uh, and, you know, your smartphone is my music player. My smartphone knows how fast I'm going. My smartphone knows where, with, with technology like Saga, knows where I was before and where I'm likely to go next. Um, and what we focus on in our app is not the recapitulation of everything that you've ever done, but why, you know, the fact that you were happy and that you did close a deal and that you, you know, that you are excited about the next things that are coming or you're late for the flight because you spent too much time celebrating in Palo Alto. Um, you know, all of that data is what you want to read back in that, that, that recapitulation, that story of your life. Uh, you know, if I go back six months from now, I want to say, I don't want to f understand the fact that I listened to 17 tracks of the Beastie Boys. I want to understand that I was feeling triumphant during that period of time. And, and that's the same kind of insight that, uh, and this may be kind of a hackneyed segue, but that's the same kind of insight that we can, you know, as a panel here, are working on providing from these data streams. Um, you know, John talked a little bit about, you know, looking at the, you know, and autom ultimately automating the process of looking at your supermarket receipt to be able to help you understand what macro and micronutrients you initially would be focusing on. Um, Ted, why don't you talk a little bit about some of the analysis that you do? I mean, this, mm -hmm. is, this, is, the, this is the secret sauce behind uh, Pocket Doc. Right. Um, so we, we come at the, the data streams and liquid data in a slightly different fashion right now because we're trying to make sense of the, uh, the, the click-through rates, the behaviors online, and then interject that with physician data as well as insurance and claims information. And uh, the, the technical terminology for that is uh, ASCII 5010X12. How about that? That's a, that's a good mouthful. Am I supposed to go across the middle and catch the Absolutely. pass? Absolutely. Right? Um, CTO. And uh, I, I play a CTO on television. The, uh, so the, um, the, one of the main impediments, and this gets back to your, your impediment question, your data impedance question, yep. is that, that we have these data silos that we're all looking, we're trying to look across and find the proverbial uh, needle in the haystack. And what our company is really good at right now is gaining insights through these seemingly disparate data sets. So, if, um, if, if a Edna Smith is, is clicking on a certain article and has a certain deductible, and we know for a fact that she has requested three services from an oncologist, well, the probability of her having to go to some cancer research institute is very high. Mm -hmm. And, and that's the, so, so we're looking across the data, and this, this is irrespective of any, any uh, hardware enablement. Right. This, is all, this is all middle tier and upper tier data. Um, it's all, believe it or not, it's all freely available. It is amazing. Uh, one, one of the um, big changes 
and um, the 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 health online health system is the uh, the the concept of uh, share the health. Um, your health is the most private public thing. It's a very zen state. You don't want anybody to know what's wrong with you until it's extremely bad. And then there's this whole concept of the fact that we're seeing in the data that if somebody talk, people will talk about, I have a fever today on Facebook, or they'll tweet it out, I feel bad, or somebody else had a heart attack. But if there's something really wrong with you, let's say an STD, mm -hmm. you're, you probably won't talk to me online about it because you're scared you might catch it. <laughs> and literally, that's the correlation behavior that we're actually seeing in the data. It is truly astounding for, from a, um, what we call it perceptual to parameterization. Right. Right. So there's this, there's this latent um, semantic behavior that we're seeing in the data that we can actually correlate to true parameter behavior. Well, how do you figure out exactly what clinicians want to see, right? I mean, or what, in your case, what customers want to see, or in, uh, in Sonny or Evo's case, or John's case, what, what a practitioner would ultimately want to see. I mean, how? Well, we have three million, we have three million uh, practitioners on our system, so that's a pretty good data yeah. set. So how um, do you serve their needs? The, uh, and, and it's based on personalization. Um, the back end of our system is actually a, a very quick on-ramp. You know, one of the, the, this is where the banking industry and the health industry comparison came into play. The number one request we get from practitioners, i.e. doctors, I need to get online. Okay, and you know, okay, well it's not a place, first of all. You know, so um, we made a very easy way for the practitioners to build a website. And I know that seems extremely pedantic, but that is like some of the nuts and bolts behavior. Automatic subscription pay, because mm -hmm. you got to pay something, right? Right. Um, they want scheduling. They want to be able to track the user. Some very basic things. It's your raw data. I mean, it's, it's, it's extreme. Yeah, it's and then, no different than the data that. that but Evo's but you bought. got but you got to take the friction out, and that's part of the thing. That that's right? the so friction. whether it's wearability yeah. or it's that uh, pain reduction. Right. You you got to take the if you can take the friction less, then you actually can't. They'll they'll be willing to give the data. Absolutely. So you can turn it into services that are more personalized. Exactly. I mean, I don't think it's always creepy either. I mean, right. there's other ways. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, if, if you reframe it to wellness and not illness, so what we want rather than what we don't want. Uh, you have a lot of, you know, in the, in the diet space, 85 million Americans start a diet around oh, the first of the year every year, and fewer than 15% are successful at maintaining some kind of a diet change. But it's something that you want to share with your friends. So talking about the food that you bought at the grocery store or having an app or a service that gives you feedback about what you bought at the grocery store. Um, in, our, in our early studies, we found that sometimes people will cross things out before they take a picture and send it to us. And it's generally very innocuous things like uh, red wine or, or something mm. like that. Um, but as far as like starting a conversation about what's right and how I prevent illness and how I maintain wellness and what it means to me, I think, I think this is a, a good, a fertile ground for sharing. That's great. So I guess one of the questions that comes back that I keep coming back to, and, and you know, I think we're, we, we're, we're moving in the right direction. We're understanding our target market. We're understanding where we're showing people that uh, the, this kind of amalgamation of data, whether it's sensor data, whether it's behavior data, or receipt data, or insurance data, uh, is, is valuable and has, has real, you know, real value to the, the end consumer or to the practitioner. Um, I guess the question I have is why don't people, why are, you know, what causes people to drop out of our programs? Right, you know, what causes, you know, one of the things we learned early on with Saga is that people downloaded the app, they used it for four to six weeks, uh, and they dropped out. And the surprising fact was that they weren't gone forever. And about four or five, six weeks later, they came back, uh, and they were interested in life logging. And which is, for me, which was contrary to expectation, because initially we expected, well, once you understand how beautiful this resource is, this is a diary, this is rights itself, there's no cost to you, and wouldn't you want to make sure you recorded every single moment? And the feedback that we got from our market studies almost immediately was, well, you know, I was being really good for four to six weeks, uh, and then I decided I wanted to be a little bit more hedonistic, and I wanted to have a cheeseburger, and I didn't want to have people looking over my shoulder. 
Uh, and so we, we realized that you know, there is this, you know, it, we're not just an application or a wearable or another piece of technology. We're, you know, since the fact that we had, you know, Saga had that kind of purview into what you did, people viewed it as, you know, as a sharing partner, as a companion, uh, as, a, you know, as a kind of a bit of intelligence. Uh, and maybe there was even a little bit of an implicit judgment in there. Mm. You know, oh, hey, you know, Andy bought four bottles of wine this week. I wonder what's going on. And uh, the idea was could, you know, people were talking about us in terms of, oh, I wanted to hide things from Saga, or I wanted to make sure that, I, you know, I lived a, you know, kind of an unmeasured week. You know, we talk about the kind of quantified self or the measured life being worth living, and that people said, well, there are times where I don't necessarily want to be measured. Uh, and that's something I'm still coming to grips with, trying to understand that motivation. You know, if, if my shine is so beautiful that I want to wear it, uh, regardless of, you know, if I'm going to the beach or I'm going to the nightclub, um, you know, what is that motivation that causes me to leave it on the, on the, on the night table? Um, or, or not wear my body media armband or my jawbone uh, from time to time. Do you guys have any insight into this? I know it's a hard problem. Well, I'll, I'll tell a story that uh, yeah. it just, well, it's not really a story, I guess, but I think uh, people want to get good news, you know? Yeah. I think, uh, and if they don't get good news or they know they're not going to get good news, I don't think they want to hear it, you know? So from, uh, from my previous company, we did blood glucose monitoring, you know? You know, it'd be kind of cool to have a wearable device that did uh, blood glucose monitoring that was, uh, I, although I guess you have Dexcom, which is an awesome product. If anyone's worn one, I highly, you know, if you have diabetes, um, continuous glucose monitoring, it's a patch. But, um, you know, top three, five reasons why people don't test their blood sugar. Number, uh, probably one of the top ones, if not the top one, was they just didn't want to know the, the result. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, it's, Pretty hard to uh, design a product to help deal with that, right? You know, unless you, I guess you could lie to them, but you know, this <laughs> would be kind of a useless product. And so, um, not uh, and there are a lot of factors that went into that: discouragement, uh, shame, um, embarrassment of some sort, you know, anger, negative reinforcement. Yeah, you know, it's just like you don't want to know that you're 250, or and or also there's this bit of hopelessness, like whoa. I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm 180. I'm not. Ins I'm not taking insulin. What do I do with a 180? Yeah, let me add to that because I, I agree. I mean, first of all, I mean, as much as you can automate things, it's still it's kind of a lonely world to look at just yourself all the time. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and sometimes yourself lets you down because you want to be accountable. You want to be better. But there's right. always a gap between who I want to be and who I am. Right? right. There's always the intent is always there, but sometimes and sometimes we want to turn the intent off. Mm -hmm. To your point. Um, but you know, part of I think part of it in terms of getting that reflective view. Sometimes, sometimes you have to kind of keep the engagement going a little further than the maybe curiosity at the beginning and so forth. We've been learning a few tricks, like even in um, I maybe use a different diabetes story later. But like, um, you know, when I'm not sleeping well, what is it about my life that's that's so I know what I could maybe change? Mm -hmm. So I see all these bad sleep patterns. That's one thing. But if I could also look at when I do physical activity or when I sit in a car for three hours versus this and having those correlations showed to me so that I can start to kind of get to the point where maybe those days are less stressful or I get more energy because I slept better, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Um, also that I'm not in it by myself. So that a lot of times I use weight management, for example, like a lot of people have these books. They're generalized for the entire population. It's supposed to work for all of us. There's not a real personalization idea there. And it's not real world tested, right. frankly. So um, you know, we've got people who you know, lost 40 pounds. You want to lose 40 pounds? This is how five different groups did it. Right. And this is the reality. And here's plateaus that actually happened with them. And you could even reach out to them. But you could, you could almost go on a pattern that's actually real world living lab based. Right. Versus, and sometimes we found by talking to consumers about it that they, they feel a little bit more empowered by that notion that I'm not alone, number one, but also that you, know, you do have these ups and downs and you see the map right in front of you. And, and there is a way to get there, but it's not necessarily doing it just by how this book or my doctor decided to help me or not help me. And you know, like in, um, I think we've seen a little bit too in just some early work on diabetes, which is basically too, like I get this number, it's in a vacuum. But if I can correlate that number to my context, the things I do, my sleep patterns, my physical activity, the food patterns, and say, here's when they're highs, here's where the lows happen to you, so you can kind of titrate based on lifestyle, right. then it becomes a little more valuable on a daily basis. But that, that bad news is really something that can hold you back, right? And being alone in that number in a vacuum really is concerning. And so I think putting more around it so that you can actually, you still may decide to turn it off. But 
at least you can maybe engage and be part of a community aspect of it that's, that, that may kind of take a little further. And it's okay to go up and down. I think it's also okay to go up and down with, with your... And, and the other aspect to that is um, with, with the quote last mile, this, this happened with the infrastructure, uh, the telemedicine companies that we're working with. Right, so that, that closes the loop on here I have some data and there is somebody that I can actually talk to. And many times, that's really all the person needs is, is some guidance. You know, we, we forget that it's not, it's not fixing a car, it's making a person well. You know, it's the practice of the art of a, yeah. of a, of a doctor, right? And then that's one thing that we're trying to enable and, and to close the loop with the, um, the correlation functions. I find something a couple years ago called the heliotropic hypothesis, and it was the, the assumption that humans, just like plants, will grow toward the light. And I think that the, the movement where for a while we were using gamification or progress mechanics to try to motivate people or keep them engaged, rewards or celebrations, uh, in, in our app we use the notion of a celebration of, of using and, and buying healthy foods rather than rewarding people for it. Uh, we think that rewards are a disincentive, but a celebration is something that they can uh, help support their going forward. We're seeing, um, with the caveat, we're, we're the employers that we're signing up, we're seeing monetary rewards right. being a positive thing. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder how long those last though, you know? Yeah. Right. Such an extrinsic thing, I don't know. There's a, there's a Stanford professor, um, Baba Shiv, and he studies uh, economic, uh, behavioral economics. And he's done some work with the Tough Mudder competition that's very interesting about the difference between a reward mm -hmm. and its likelihood to inspire the competitor to return and a celebration. And that's, good. that's also a good point that um, the large social networks have enabled behaviors of, of, of millions and billions of return visits. And health is a very slow, as you pointed out, a very slow phase changing process. So the, the behavioral mechanics on all of our interaction models are very different than other types of online behavior. That's fair, that's a very fair answer. Uh, you know, one of the things we learned we, early on we, that you know, people don't play games that they don't necessarily, even people can't be gamified if they don't like the game that they're playing. Uh, and so we, you know, early on in a very first version of Saga, we gave points uh, associated with how, you know, the, the, how exciting or how adventurous you were in your, in your activities. And the idea is that people would try to move the needle in some way. Ah, oh, well, you know, I've only got 400 points, this experience points this week. Um, I better go out on Friday night and take my wife out for a steak dinner uh, so I can get another 250 points and, and, and keep my level up. And we reinforce in all the traditional ways. You know, you have a, a, some sort of thermometer or an infographic, uh, and you can actually come to grips with how that data changes over time. And, you know, people didn't necessarily find that valuable. They, that, was, that was not good news. What really worked you know, for us was excuse me, <clears throat> providing people with examples of other people who were living lifestyles that they were interested in. Yeah. Uh, and so in Saga Today, you can actually follow other people's life logs. Uh, so Ted can kind of, if, if Ted and I are friends, Ted can choose to follow my life log and see how my life differs from his. Uh, and you know, we all have ex you know, experiences of that one person who just unbelievably, you know, how does he or she get all of that stuff done in a day? You know, you've got three kids and runs a company and gets up at 4.30 in the morning and runs marathons. Um, and the idea was by providing that exemplar, if you chose to, you know, you chose to emulate that exemplar or that person, uh, that was a motivating principle. And so your correspondence to that was always good news, right? Any kind of incremental step you took towards being more and more like that person uh, was good news. Uh, and, you know, we learned very quickly not to remind them that they had fallen off the track, you know, fallen off the, off the pace. Um, so let's, you know, let's come back a little bit full circle here in terms of talking about uh, how we would envision in the next, you know, 18 to 24 months interacting with a healthcare practitioner. I mean, we have, each of us have data and we, and we see this trend of e-patients that are coming, uh, that, are, that are here. Uh, you know, what's the, what's the right way to be able to translate, you know, what, what do we expect the right way to be able to translate our saga data or our, our, our fitness data or our, our habits data uh, to the practitioner? You know, what kinds of barriers do we, you know, are, are we uh, looking at? I guess the first one I would talk about is quality. Uh, do we expect a healthcare practitioner to be able to judge the data that comes from a shine or a, a jawbone uh, to be uh, quality data? Or it, 
Is there a perception there? I mean, is there, is there a perception that it's good enough, or is there something that we have to counter there? Uh, I could I could talk a little bit about yeah, sure. um, so so the the idea of creating a record so the in in grocery shopping right now you get a big long receipt most people toss it out uh, it gets lost somewhere along the line um, I was lucky enough to find a family that had kept every receipt for five years and um, when I s interviewed them I asked them you know what would be interesting for you they were fascinated to find out on almost a mint.com. Uh, a mint sort of style of, a, of an audit of what they've been buying. Now, I never thought about it like this, except for your question, Andy, but um, you know, I suppose something like that, if there was really an you know, a ongoing record of everything that the family bought, uh, a practitioner or a dashboard that we could create could help interpret that and turn it into meaning. Um, that wasn't really the intention. For us, the intention was to, to simply try to introduce new things into that system, and it's kind of a self-directed uh, process. But I think looking out further past like personal health records and, right. and a more integrated system, you could connect it to exercise and physiology and travel and yeah. lots of other things. I guess areas. what I'm trying to get at is how much is too much. Right? We have electronic health records. We have vast amounts of storage space. We have uh, burgeoning or technologies that allow us to fuse and merge records mm -hmm. from different sorts. Um, you know, in five years, are we going to be in a world where I take, I'm able to, my doctor is able to request, and I would be willing to hand over the complete activity trace that I had from all the activities that I engaged in in a six-month period with Saga, or my fitness le or my activity level from, that came from my Misfit wearable, you know, 5.0. Um, I mean, are, um, are, we, are we looking at that world? Yeah, or is so this still going to be personal data and sacrosanct that, from our EH? That's on the cons you're, you're talking more from the consumer side, and, and now we're flipping over to the practitioner, quote, enterprise side. Yeah. Um, well, we, 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 Pocket Dog, deals in that world, and, and it's a very interesting way we look at, at the problem set. We have about, um, on any given day, 800,000 certified uh, physicians in the United States of America. Um, our target, when we say, well, what's your target market? Well, uh, there's 300 million people. They've probably been sick at one time in their life looking for a service. Um, that's an asymmetric matching model, right? Yep. Um, so the, the stuff that we are, believe it or not, that we're dealing with is the very nuts and bolts of things like invalid addresses, wrong phone numbers, zip codes, um, invalid... Um, invalid uh, data that actually comes from these reputation management companies, et cetera. So I think that it would, it would be nice to think that within 12 months, the, 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 we, could, we could come up with a data hygiene, like in other industries, we say, you know, here's your amount of a lift yeah. on, a, on a data hygiene right. for, for, for a feature extraction. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I saw, I saw a recent article that the practitioners are divorcing. They, they're divorcing their uh, electronic health record systems. And for good reason, because they're seeing the, the uh, consumerization of the enterprise moving online, right? And, and that's where we're headed with our back end. However, there's some very fundamental things that have to, have to happen. Formats have to be standardized. Mm -hmm. Uh, we get everything from uh, a 30 year old database formats to JPEGs to JPEGs of Microsoft Word format. I mean, p somebody took a picture of a Microsoft Word for document and sent to us. And we had to convert it. So there's some very nuts and bolts things that are not very sexy. And I think the time horizon, uh, you know, we do have some practitioners who are very avant garde. They don't take, uh, they, they take no insurance. They use WePay. We have a WePay model and a, a Braintree model. They have uh, recurring revenue models and subscriptions. Uh, they, have, uh, they, they don't have the concept of a super bill. They roll up their CPT codes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there, there's one thing, ICD-10 CPT codes, right? Yeah. So I think that in the near term, before we can have this, uh, Contextual aware, grand unified field theory for the practitioner. I would love it if uh, Sonny and Evo gave me an API and I could say, this is the service that you need for this price right now. We have some nuts and bolts we have to get past. Andy, maybe the like framing the, the thought is this, is that we live in this world that the signal to noise ratio is, is really a problem. We, we're surrounded by devices. There's 
information flowing constantly, how can we be sure that we're not just creating more things that are more noise for people? Right. And how do we strengthen those signals uh, and either share them with their healthcare team or feed them back? Uh, uh, one of the first sessions that uh, I listened to here talked about the 99.x percent of our life that is spent providing ourselves self-care. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, the idea of ambient collection of data and then reflection that we can provide to people, especially if we enhance the signal, is in fact the, the, the gift that we can give to our customers or to our users. And someday later, uh, when we have more information and we can interpret it more clinically, uh, I think that there's a, lot, there's a lot of promise the Internet of Things will bring and, right. and so forth. You know, but part, of it, part of that, the Internet of Things, though, is that noise. It is a lot of noise right. level, right? Because there's, there's a lot of friction using all those things, and they do inundate you. So I think it's just early still mm -hmm. in one way. Mm -hmm. I think there's another thing going on where it's just, um, you know, I, I'm not sure that there's a lot of discussions go on in, both in our offices with other, other players in the field, different discussions and conferences, you know, how good is good enough and mm -hmm. so right. forth. Uh, the way we grew up as a medical device company, we had to make sure we had val validity behind what we were doing. And I do, and that's okay. I think in the meantime, whether it's an FDA device or not, I think you got to get out to the masses. You got to show people the value of this. And and uh, and over time, you're going to get it to simplified nuggets uh, because you're going to see it in mass. Mm -hmm. And seeing it at like a thousand subjects versus you know three million is a totally different level of scale. Right, right. And then once you start to have those pieces, I think there's no reason why it wouldn't become part of what is a transactional system right exactly. now. Right. There is gaps of time in all these transactions that happen. And then if you go to home monitoring, yeah, let's say one blood pressure a day. I mean, there's no continuity between those data pieces. And so for them to have any meeting, I think this has to come in. But it's probably going to have to have some validity and credibility behind exactly. it. And maybe the consumer scale of it makes it credible. Mm -hmm. Maybe it has to go through clinical trials for it to be credible. I'm not sure what the answer is. I know certain pockets have certain decisions. But you know, one of the things I always thought was like, the, we always were told if the doctor recommends it, everyone's going to want it. And yet the doctors are, you know, they're, they're trained up to be diagnostic. They're not trained up to be lifestyle coaches necessarily. Mm -hmm. And, but this lifestyle information is, is what they prescribe back a lot. So, and the personalized coverage mm -hmm. or personalized care, right. I think that's an input, right? right? Mm -hmm. And it's an input that when you look at only transaction, you're basically looking at a bunch of sick people and you don't see all the other things that are going on there and the things they do in between those moments and so forth. And so it should become a big informative that actually does personalize medicine. Um, so maybe we're just a little early, but I, c I can't see why it wouldn't come in to this transactional model with EHRs and doctor's offices right. and everything else. Um, and I don't have to go to a life coach in order for my, my, my doctor to be my coach. Yeah, the consumerization of the back-end office. Right. Yeah. right? Yeah. And, and, and one of the things I, I am extremely cognizant of is um, I want the doctors to perform the art and let the data scientists do the data science. And, and, you know, I'm not a doctor, I don't want to be, I'm sure there's, you know, but there's this Reese's peanut butter cup mixture that we have to meet on the same line and everybody shake hands and agree on terminology, right? Yep. Um, I, I, I don't want- And agree that computer science is a science sometimes. Exactly, <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, I, I, I do not, I personally, and this is for me, I personally do not want my doctor trying to, you know, understand what a support vector machine is. Oh no 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 no! Do you understand? No, that? Of and, course. And, and we're seeing we're seeing a lot a lot of that the iting of a doctor. Yeah. I do think though that and I this you know we I, this may be kind of the wrap the kind of wrapping as we wrap up here and and, and open up the audience for any kind of questions. I do think that little data is you know as we as I referred to it in our preamble is a, is a concept whose time will come. Right, whether that's done, I think where we're seeing it now, and my oncologist has been talking to me about this, in terms of you know individual doctors will be motivated to be able to gather you know, streams of data, whether from wherever they come, if they can do some of this basic analysis. Um, you know, if you're looking for you know more inputs at some basic level is always better than fewer inputs, uh, especially if you're dealing with an individual case and looking for causation for different kinds of sources. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so little data is a, is a concept that's coming. It's clear that technologies like the ones built by these gentlemen up here on, on stage uh, and applications, you know, by, by the millions now uh, are going to be more and more valuable in terms of providing 
uh, valid data, sources of data that we can use in diagnosis. Uh, you know, the jury's still out, and you've heard it from here that and how we're ultimately going to be able to use this in in the, in our in our true process. Uh, but that's something that we're willing to work on. Okay, so I'm going to. I'd like to. You know, if you could join me in thanking the panel, and then I'd. Thank you. And then I'd like to open it up to any of you if you have questions. We have about 10 minutes left in the time that's allotted for us. Uh, so if you want to ask questions from the, the founder of Body Media or the founder of Misfit Wearables uh, or, or John or Ted or myself, uh, we're, all, we're open and willing to answer any questions you might have. Hi, my name is Jules. I'm a nurse and I'm also a professional data tracker. I've had type 1 diabetes for 30 years and I also have a young daughter who has type 1 diabetes. So I have two glucometers, two continuous glucose monitors, two insulin pumps, cords to plug everything in. I have data galore. But there isn't one central thing to connect and make it easy for us to use those numbers to make a difference in our care. <clears throat> it takes a lot of effort on my part to do that. My question is, why aren't we seeing anything that's combining that? We have a lot of apps that are out there but it requires more data input on our part. And the other second prong question is, do you have any thoughts about directing these wearables towards the 79 million people we have that have prediabetes? I think these are both fabulous questions. Um, yeah, we've, anyone who want to jump in first, Sonny? Sonny knows diabetes pretty well, but we definitely have some ideas. Um, the, uh, so the, I mean, there are, there are some tools uh, that do bring some of this data together. Uh, companies like Diasend, D-I-A-S-E-N-D, and um, Sweetspot, acquired by uh, Dexcom. They bring pump, uh, I think they, yeah. yeah. You can combine pump, um, CGM, and, discrete and BGM data you know, all in one place. And there's some logging tools on top of that. Uh, so there, there are a few of these tools. They're not a lot, but I agree. Uh, these are... You know, um, we could use some better tools out there. Uh, in terms of addressing um, this segment of uh, this population segment with uh, pre-diabetes and diabetes, you know, that's the world we came from. So pretty familiar with it. And um, to the extent that activity monitoring can be helpful, and I think it, it can be, um, we'd love to serve that community. Uh, we don't have any products specifically targeted towards uh, people with diabetes right now. You know, pretty familiar with it. Yeah, yeah we're, I mean, it, it is unfortunate that there's not a way to digest the information. Even, even what is out there right now for your concern is specifically about the diagnostic information only, and it's not, it's not able to merge these other pieces. Mm -hmm. um, for a long time, we were asked, so a little sidebar. So we have this, you know, a lot of people call our product on the arm, like this little toy product. It's, got, it's a fitness product, all this other stuff. What we learned was when we started looking at the data longitudinally with a lot of these different conditions, is that the body goes through this cause and effect relationship with these different condition changes that happen, whether it's COPD or it's diabetes or something else. And so the body has these results that affect your metabolism, affect the conductivity of the skin, all these other things. So, so we started learning that we could actually predict some of these things going on. Now, no one's probably going to believe that necessarily, especially if it's done with computer science. So, so we, we stopped doing as much work on that, but we got a long way. And a lot of people still ask for the predictive model so that I could get rid of all those other tools. And I think the real answer, though, in the current environment is not to be uh, replace, re replaceive, but to actually be, um, you know, augmentative to, to, the, to the products that are out there and give more context to them. And so um, we're, while we're not a diabetes company today and there's a lot of other, there's also we're distracted by a lot of other interests. We have a lot of pull for our products and all the different product lines we have that we, we just can't keep up with demand on. So like we're really trying to make sure we honor, you know, honor that consumer opportunity there while we're keeping a vision for where we really believe the opportunity is. And we've, when I've done the diabetes research, it's always been with pre and type two and type one, but mostly because of this huge opportunity when we've talked to them, they've said, I want a lifestyle model. I want to understand the cause and effect relationships of these things, and there's nothing to do that with. So we've been building analytics engines. We've been building uh, you know, products that have a few more sensors in them to be a little bit more lifestyle accurate um, so that they can actually try to pull that together. Um, there's still some pushback from the industry, um, whether or not we could do it ourselves. 
So we're also starting to have some, you know, there's, there's definitely discussions going on uh, with other diabetes companies and monitoring companies about how they can better serve patients like you and, and your family and, and trying to figure out what exactly that's, that can fit. But the weird thing that's happening is, this, is it, you said banking versus healthcare. What's weird too is like back at like 15 years ago, corporate wellness really wanted to do something that was more personalized than like, you know, radio switches on WebMD for searching the web to make it personalized. And then they said, well, it, they knew it was expensive to do things like devices or apps and so forth. So they just went with some more web pages with more yeah. content. Yeah. And I see that happening in the industry. I see that happening in a lot of diagnostic product companies where they're, they're just kind of trying to do more content and maybe a little like fake social communities. And they're not really thinking about really driving hard toward what there's really being asked for. And so while we're trying, and we're trying to put the pieces in place to get there in time, um, right, it's not, it, we, can't, we won't be able to fulfill it immediately. And there's a lot of pressures from the external environment to not kind of do it as fast as we would love to do it. And so what will probably happen is that at some point we're just gonna say, we don't care what they keep telling us. We're just gonna do it anyway. Yep. And um, we've done that before, and we've taken some arrows for doing that. But I think in the end, that's what it's going to take. Um, you know, like what Pocket Doc is doing too. Like, there's a lot of arrows coming about, but there's a lot of people who love it because now I'm democratizing my opportunity to look at what I really have to pay for healthcare. You know, there's this whole different thing going on. And so I think there's going to have to be a little more disruption in order to serve your need. And I think it's the most one of the most valuable vectors out there to go serve. Uh, and I'd like to say th thank you. Um, my ninth user is, uh, is a gentleman who is pre-diabetic, and we spent a lot of time with him. So um, watch this space. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Please. Hello, guys. My name is Yang Yu. Twitter handle is uh, Mr. Yang Yu. Um, my question is, actually, I'll begin with not a question. Feed a man a fish, and you'll feed him for one day. Teach a man how to fish, and you'll feed him a lifetime. I'm sure you guys have heard of that. Assuming that healthcare is the fish, and being good in health is that fish, where do you see the role of wearables in the future? And I would say specifically, how does, how does that fit into the rest of the healthcare system? Thank you. I think there's, you know, I can, I can speak to the kind of data asset that we create uh, on a smartphone. I think, you know, I was, uh, I, I can speak personally, I was diagnosed where I was diagnosed with metastatic stage three C uh, melanoma almost three years ago. Mm. And I had surgery and right about the same time I started this company. And I got really excited about the fact, you know, about six months in after in going through my recovery uh, and learning that my wife was pregnant with our two-year-old, now two-year-old, I got really excited about the, uh, the asset that my smartphone was creating for me, right? Here was a digital record of everything that my two-year-old's daddy did while he was recovering. And I took that into my oncologist. And I said to her, I said, here's what my February, she's like, you know, my three-month checkup, she said, well, how's it been going? And I actually presented her with data. And I said, <laughs> you know, here's how my activity, you know, here's how, here's what my January looked like. It, it sucked. Uh, my February was a little bit better and my March looks pretty much normal. And how do I know what normal looks like? Well, I had some data from before. Uh, and that kind of asset uh, to me was something that, and to my, in my care, my current care uh, is something that we use. Uh, and it's something that my cl clinician is figuring out exactly how to use and how to build in terms of all the other arsenal tools that she has to monitor. Uh, I believe that you know the first mile that we're going to see, uh, we're, we're you know many of us in this room are using this data right now, are fishing right now, uh, and we're using you know the the approximate measures, the exact measures, or the the kind of guidance and feedback that we get from services to be able to adjust our behavior and to fish in different ways. Uh, and then we're evangelizing, you know, as, as we talked about this morning, you know, it's not enough to be able to have that finding, it's about you have to evangelize that finding to somebody else. Uh, and mechanisms like what John is building or, or what we're seeing are built around uh, wearables right now, uh, you know, are ways to be able to evangelize those patterns of behavior and be those exemplars. But what we're doing right now is, is we're creating assets and we're creating assets that we couldn't create 18 months ago uh, and we're doing it with innovative technology that no one's ever dreamt up before. 
uh, and we're doing it in a way that has mass appeal. Uh, and I hope, you know, my, my sincerest hope is that, you know, in five years, we're all going to have one of these kinds of digital assets uh, that we can use, and then the burden will be on for us as scientists or computer scientists to be able to interpret that uh, and provide insight that can be used in the medical community to further the next generation of breakthroughs. So is it more about enabling behavior or is it about displacing the part of our brain that cares about ourselves? Uh, I, think it's about, I think it's about recording and based on your personality type, you'll do, uh, you'll do what you will do. You know, if you want to be a boy with his, or his data uh, and you use that to be able to be the best you that you can be, uh, we'll enable that. Uh, if you want to run from it, uh, that's great. But we're in a world already where our smartphones and are going to be you know, and our, the ubiquitous devices that we carry, whether it's in our home or whether it's in our pocket or whether it's on our arm, they're going to be gathering this data whether we like it or not. Uh, and, you know, we're, it's going to be all, of, you know, the, for the, the community of the future to decide how we take best full and fullest advantage of that data. I think we have time for one more question. So this, I, this, is, this is... Okay. Thanks. Uh, I'm Mike McConnell. I'm a cardiologist here at Stanford. And uh, in kind of follow-up to your statement, the struggle that I have is there's almost way too much data. So every device is collecting a different form of data. There are many, many, many different variables. And uh, there's no great way for me to connect that with my patients. And so I'm, I'm struggling or pleading or trying to figure out how this ecosystem of wearables is going to find a way to improve the transition of that data to clinicians. Uh, we have a number of standard metrics. We look at steps. We look at number of active minutes per week. There are lots of guidelines for you know healthy behaviors, but the data currently is collected in so many different forms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, how can we really get that in a way that it's easy to connect. Well, I'll give, you a quick, I'll give you a quick answer and then, and then I'll let Ted have the last word. Uh, I think it's going to have to happen on in, in, in practitioner technologist partnerships. Uh, I'll, uh, quick examples, we, we have the ability to recognize whether you're outdoors or indoors and understand the UV that level that you're exposed to. And so we've been working with a team of dermatologists in Seattle uh, to be able to build a custom app that allows us to use the sensors on the phone to be able to monitor your aggregate UV level. Uh, and it's something that those, that class of practitioners really, really wanted, uh, and there wasn't a need in the marketplace, just like we talked about with diabetes. And so we were able to you know, step in, fill that gap at, at a level. Yeah, so uh, um, the, the, the reducing the friction or reducing your pain as a cardiologist with the situational awareness that you, the, that you are dealing with is which panic, which panic alert or which stoplight chart, if you will, red, yellow, or green, which is the most important context at any one given time for any one given patient, right? And it's a, it's a combinatorial model. It's extremely difficult. What we actually want to do, and that's why we're starting from the bottom up, is given, given your patient constituency, we want to be able to connect these devices down actually all the way to bundled CPT codes. Hopefully, in, to say, you know, for Edna Smith, this is the type of services she possibly might need. And that's how we're trying to solve this, this data fusion problem. And he might be able to get that because, so here's the, it hasn't been scale yet. The data hasn't been there. You, we haven't even shown you any studies that say your sleep patterns and, you know, sleeping worse every day and getting less and less active is actually a decline in health, right? There's right. a lot, there's some of this that has to happen. But once feedback you, loop. Right, so once you have it in scale, which is going to, you know, which is happening more and more, and you're connecting it to these different cases, which is not just held by an EHR by my provider or, or whatever, then... Then what's interesting is that now it has, a, it has a way where you have this microscope out in the world, and now you can start to find where these things, so that when you know when to pay attention or where to pay attention or which data bits we should be giving you when the patient comes in, right? And right now it's still kind of unknown. I can go to five different cardiologists. They would tell me five different standards, and they would tell me that these devices, five, four of the five would tell me they don't care about what the device says. So, but we got to prove it. Right? We got to prove that some of this, stuff. some of it will happen in the wild, some will happen with controlled studies. You know, I think the hospital readmission issue that's coming up is going to change a lot of stuff too. Uh, you know, just putting those big boxes in people's homes is not going to work. 
So you're going to have to, you know, you're going to start to see lifestyle parameters come in as a vital sign. And once that gets understood, then that's going, to come, that's going to parlay over to a lot simpler conversation, I think. But right now, they're not considered that. They're considered these kind of conveniences, things you do if you're trying to you know, get in your genes better. It's really not considered the same level. Uh, like, you know, sedentary is the next smoking, right? I mean, there's, th these are serious stuff coming. It just more and more of this has to bubble up. Ivo, I think that has to be the last word. Thank you, everyone, so much. We're really grateful for your participation and your support.